welcome, welcome, welcome. So we are thrilled. We are so excited for, uh, for uh, today's, today's episode. We have a good friend of ours, uh, Brad Gibb, coming on. And uh, so a little backstory. We, uh, Chris and I are part of a mastermind group called Offer Lab. And uh, I think it was back in May, uh, we, uh, we had the, uh, the privilege of going to, the, to this mastermind. And during the very last day, they call it the asset day, during the very last day, we got a chance to go uh, from table to table and, and have a 10 minute conversation with all the coaches that are involved in this, in this mastermind. Well, uh, Chris and I went to one table, 10 minutes later, we had another table. And then we finally ended up at, uh, at Brad's table. And when the 10 minute alarm went off, we didn't move. <laughs> we, were like, we, we are not moving. And another 10 minute alarm went off and another one. And we were literally there for an hour, uh, just getting our minds blown. Uh, we look behind us and there's 10 people gathered around us, uh, listening to the gold that, uh, that, our, that this gentleman is, was spitting out. Yeah, so they eventually had to stop us. But fortunately, we went to dinner that night and we got to sit right across from him. And he, like, the reason this podcast exists was from the conversation we had at dinner that night. And our trajectory right now is, like, is influenced by this gentleman, Brad Gibb. And so, I mean, like, I, I am so excited for you to hear this because we, uh, in full disclosure, we're a part of his mastermind too called Cashflow Tactics Acceleration Mastermind. And it is changing our world. And our hope for this podcast is that what you hear changes your world. So Brad, thank you so much. Uh, welcome to Yoga Entrepreneur Secrets. Thank you guys. I'm equally excited to be on here. It's so cool how when worlds come together, like I've said stuff about like, I can't, you, you won't believe how smart the Axe Brothers are about what they're doing in their business and in yoga and just their approach to life. And we talk about knife throwing and martial arts and all this cool stuff. So it's fun that we just, we get to be nerds in the things we're good at and then exchange with those that are, that are better than us in other places. So I'm, I'm excited to be on. Thanks, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. So like, I know you're humble and you probably won't admit this, but I know personally, like you are the smartest dude I know, hands down, <laughs> anyone in my life. And I just want like to give, like to give the listeners a backstory as to like your education, how, you know, what, like, how did you, how did you come to be the guy that you are today? Uh, yeah. So I'll, I won't go like, in the beginning, I was a twinkle <laughs> that far back, right? But um, back, so I grew up very entrepreneurial, but didn't know that that was a thing. I grew up on, uh, my brother is now our fourth generation family farm in the state of Washington. So my dad, his dad, his dad, and there isn't a more entrepreneurial place than a farm. There's no instruction manual. And if you don't do what you need to do, things die on you, right? And so it's just like, get it done. Um, and so, so I grew up in that, but then, you know, farms can only support so many people and we, you need a lot of labor when you're kids, but then only one's going to stay and take over the farm. And everybody knew that was my little brother. That was like, he was, that was his destiny, not mine. So I packed up and left and then said, well, how am I supposed to go out and be successful? And I heard the same narrative told to everybody else. Well, you need to, uh, you need to get good grades and you need to go to a good school and get a good education and get a good job. And then that's, that's what's going to lay the foundation. So I did those things and I'm, oh, I'm a little bit competitive. I, you guys know that we'll find that out. But, um, and, and I'm kind of, if, if one degree was good, why not get four? Right. <laughs> so I got into the world of accounting. Um, and then, so I got a, a bachelor's and master's in accounting, but while I was there, instead of doing what everybody else did, like I went to summer school, not to graduate any faster, but so that I could take all the classes that they wouldn't let me take inside of my major. So I'm actually only a few credits short of an MBA from BYU, uh, from the college I went to, which is BYU. Um, but I also, in that process of just taking extra classes because I wanted to, I got a degree in economics and statistics um, as I as I went through and did that. So as, as you can see, I like kind of all things numbers and all things analysis with that anchor in, in accounting. So that was my, um, that route. Um, I, I, and then when I graduated, um, I was still making this good job and, and land and really solidify my future. So I fought and fought. I took some pretty massive at the time. We didn't realize how big of a risk they were in, you know, in hindsight. Um, but I was entering the job market when the economy was melting down in 2008. Um, and I graduated with no job, no prospects and said, I'm, I'm going to get a job on wall street when it was imploding. It was a little bit before it was imploding, but um, so I, I started with Goldman Sachs uh, in New York City 
and spent some time there. Um, and so that's, that's kind of my background from an education and a professional standpoint was I kind of got my start in those, in those two areas. Gotcha. So, um, when you said you worked for Golden Sachs. Yeah. And like you, so you were in Goldman Sachs during the 2007, 2008 meltdown. meltdown. Yeah. So our building, if you remember like the big tee off to the whole collapse was Lehman Brothers bankruptcy overnight, right? Solvent, when they closed their doors, when they opened their doors, they were insolvent and bankrupt and sent everybody home. Our building was next door to their building. And that morning, I still remember getting off the subway, walking out, and then floods of people coming out of Lehman building with box, cardboard boxes in their hands. So we were like at ground zero. And so obviously nothing got done for two weeks. We just sat in the lobby hoping they weren't going to lock the doors on us at Goldman too, because everything, the whole, the whole financial world was in upheaval. Um, but yeah, we had a literal front row seat to what was contributing to it, what was going on, what was being done about it. I mean, we had, we had policymakers coming in and meeting with our teams and talking through how we're navigating all this. I mean, it was just one of those just sat there and absorbed, I mean, amazing, terrible but an amazing experience to sit there and have a front row seat to that yeah totally so when you uh when you were there you were an employee for goldman sachs yep. and you saw the meltdown around you did you know the writing was on the wall for you at that point in goldman or is there some other thing that like how was no, it that was i i and i knew it pretty early i just couldn't admit it to myself because like i said i had these entrepreneur seeds in me um that i was suppressing and even while i was at college i was like I didn't want to just take the list of classes they gave me. I'm like, but that sounds cool. And that sounds cool. And that sounds cool. And so I, I designed my own educational path through there. And then while at Goldman, same thing, I was always the one being like, why can't I go to that meeting? Why can't I learn this? I want to take this training. Tell me how to do this. Uh, and nobody, pretty quickly, people didn't like me there. Um, and so there was already tension. But what pushed it over the edge for me to say, no, I got to get out of here. Well, first off, just the moral side of it. I want to get into like everything that's there, but we, uh, I just couldn't do wall street. Yeah. But the, the bigger thing that pushed me out was I remember very distinctly sitting in these meetings and in the lobby, watching the financial news. And I was low man on the totem pole. So I knew I was done. Like if, if they were cut off, you know, layoffs or cutbacks or whatever, like I knew I was on the chopping block, but I looked at the person next to me who'd been there three years and he was just as scared as I was. And the person there was five years was just as scared as I was. And, the, and my manager's manager who'd been there 15 years was just as scared and worried as affected as I was. And I was like, wait a minute, this whole get a good job thing, there is no security in my job, in my profession, even at Goldman Sachs. And so that's when I was like, well, if I can't even get that out of all of this, then I need to, to be the one in charge. And at least if I go down, I know that I was, the, you know, my hands were on the wheel. And so that was the shift to say, okay, I can't, I, I can't stay in a independent of Goldman Sachs. I couldn't stay in a firm structured kind of that way. And so I'm out, I'm, I'm doing entrepreneur. I'm going to figure out something. So Brad, with that, that was kind of, so that was the, that was, was that the catalyst? Was that like the breaking point when you were like, I'm going, I'm going and doing my own thing. Or did you, did you after that still, search out a quote unquote nine to five or working with somebody or was that it, it, it was it was I'm always the kind of person that like I can't let go of the vine when I'm swinging to the next one like I want both of them and so um, I leveraged my contacts and uh, my brother also graduated accounting and so just like you guys we sort of teamed up and we joined a, a firm with own, like a very new startup and so it was just four of us there and then we quickly stepped into ownership and then we actually split from that group because we developed a little different expertise. And then within a year or two, we were on our own with our own, with our own firm. And so that, that was kind of the process out as we looked for something that had the seeds of, like it could bridge the gap. And I mean, I had kids, I had a mortgage, I had stuff I needed to take care of. And so it was, it was a bridge into it, but it, in the interviews, it was how does ownership work? How do we get in and how do we contribute and, and how do we make this? So we were brought in with that kind of that expectation of it. And then like I said, within, within a couple of years, we were it, it fully into our own thing. My, my brother and I, and then one other partner. 
Gotcha. That's such an interesting transition because you, you went from employee to employer, like from I'm, I'm working for somebody to this is now mine. That's not just like a, that's not a lateral shift. That is an entire like paradigm shift that requires more than just a decision to like, Hey, I think I'm going to open my own business. Like, what was that like for you? And what were some of the, like the struggles that you had or, and what like the, the epiphanies and, I mean, obviously you had the entrepreneurial spirit that was being suppressed and maybe it was just, it just felt natural for you, but was there something specific about that that made it more challenging than? Uh, man, like I'll give credit to my wife on this one. Like she all the way along was the one being like, why are you still here? Like why are, clearly you're good at this. You can handle all this stuff. You got to figure out just, just do it already so that you can stop coming home and being miserable and complaining to me. Like, let's just, we're in, let's go do it. So a lot of it was we laid, we laid a lot of those foundations, but um, honestly, the scary part about it is the conditioning I had to, I had to get out of my mind around was the, one of the most damaging things about a college education, as, as amazing as it is and as important as mine was, like I couldn't have had the technical ability that I needed to start my business because I started my business around my technical expertise in accounting. So our firm, what we did was we became the CFOs for hire to take a company public. So if you wanted to go public, you hired us, we came in, we cleaned your books up, and we interacted with your investors, the SEC, and the entire process to like launch you and take you. And we did over two dozen company, uh, two dozen uh, public launches with our clients. I had to have an accounting degree to be able to do that. But the thing I had to unlearn was in college, you were taught that there's an answer in the back of the book and you would do the problem and then check your answer. Stepping into entrepreneurship was like, wait a minute, like, where's the back of the book? Where do I check if my answer's correct? You, the, your bank account was the back of the book of whether the answer worked or not. You couldn't find it. So that was the biggest struggle of getting okay with how do I make a decision that I then say this is right, right? With, without anybody else, without any back of the book answers. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And the, one of the reasons I wanted to ask it is because in the yoga world, and even in the business ownership, people who actually have yoga studios, there is a lot of them who still hang on to their other job, their nine to five ish or whatever side hustle they have going on for fear of going all in on it. And I, I to articulate that, that exactly that, that mind shift that had to happen and that, that willingness to lean, to not have the answer, but to go for it anyway. And then you find the answer in that's kind of like the, in the process, in the process. Yeah. It just comes out as you go, but, and we'll get to there. And this is why it's so exciting to be on here is a lot of what we now teach with our clients is the process of how do you be on, how does your money match your entrepreneurialness um, and give you, cause we're taught to give away all of our money and give away all of our power because we have our job. Right. And because that's the steadfast thing we flip it around and that's what I had already started building. So I got to make a transition in a much different position than most people do. I was, I was much more liquid than most people did. I already had multiple sources of income coming in. And so it wasn't going from zero to one. Um, and that's a lot of what I would teach. So in the transition, now that you've got two sources of income, if you've got a job and you're still doing your yoga studio, what we need to do is, is just keep that teeter totter balancing until the value of the job is to where it's like, you know what, this isn't even that important to me anymore anyway. And a lot of it just comes into, how to, how to, how to mirror those, those challenges of an entrepreneur with the money to support that decision instead of actually make it worse, right. which is what most financial advice does. Right. So that there, like what you, what you described is you had this, this, uh, this expertise that you had to have, right. You had to have, you had to have that, that mastery level to, to move into uh, the entrepreneur space and start your own thing. But then there's also, so like in the, in the yoga world, it's the same thing as like Chris and I got really good at teaching yoga and breaking down systems and putting frame, frame work, frameworks around them. And then, but then when we got into actually running a business, we realized, holy shit, this isn't yoga. <laughs> this, is in way, but like, this is running a business. Like we studied yoga. We didn't study running a business. We got to level up our game. Was that what, did you bump up against that? And did you, did you seek out coaches and like what, or did you, was part of your, your training, uh, your, your education, did it, did it help with that? Oh, oh man, that, so mine is, mine is stretched out a little bit more. So having um, like an accounting firm is like cut and paste. It's like an attorney's firm as well. Like 
the business models there, the structures there, the decision making, I had already folded into it. Like it was literally copy paste. And now I can do what I was doing over there on our side and it all works out. So a lot of the, ch the initial challenges of how do I run a business, like Bill Blowers was already there, the pay structure, it's already there because they're buying a, they're buying a service that, that already exists in the marketplace, mm -hmm. right? So for that initial transition, it was a lot easier to say, how am I gonna like put the structure together? It wasn't until I left that business behind and started what we're doing now at Cashflow Tactics, where we're like, we have to create a whole, something no one's ever done before in an industry and in a way that is, is so traditional that's where we have run into that over and over and over again. And it's like every quarter, it's like we show up to our planning feeling like we just got kicked in the groin, <laughs> but like taking, reframing that as no, these are just opportunities to make our business better. We're only having these problems. It's coming out of the success we've had leading up to this point. But you mentioned the, the turning point, like we just, the biggest struggle I had in business was not leaving Goldman to start my own. Cause like I said, we had, we had a roadmap for that. That was actually pretty easy. The harder one was shifting out into what's now cash flow tactics. And we got almost zero traction until we wrote a check to a, to a mentor. And that was the first investment directly into ourselves and saying, I, I, I see a gap and I don't have the answers and I can't get the answers out of reading another, another 300 page business book um, or a personal development book. Like it has to come from somebody that has experience that's walked it before and I need a coach. Yeah. And as soon as that was the shift and I, we're on video, right? I'm going to grab this. I'm going to show you guys what this led to and you guys will relate to it. I keep this in my closet right here to make this point, but this is every tag or conference or program that I've gone to since making that first investment. Like the first one is in here somewhere. I think it's actually this one, right? But it led to just constant needing to go and find and invest in myself to, to be able to bridge those gaps. That's huge. It's huge because that, that it's the investment in yourself. And so, uh, I have one question and because I really want to dive into like the, the, the tactical aspect of like what we're going to talk about today. Um, Can I bring up a spreadsheet? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, open up, we'll open up Excel in just a little bit. <laughs> um, so when you made the transition from uh, the business that you, uh, that you quit to, oh, to, to start Cashflow Tactics, was it the pool of Cashflow Tactics and this new different thing that you wanted or was it the struggle of of in the world that you were in because it's i remember talking to you saying you were making a bunch of money things were good financially was it in good totally or was it there was something there going on you see what i'm saying were you pulled or yeah you pulled? yeah like i mean I, I hear the stories of like entrepreneurs that rose out of the ashes right like they were at rock bottom and and while those stories are amazing and inspiring i don't want to take anything away because i've never been there and i don't want to like that is to to like instead of paying your rent like doing ad spend on Facebook. Like I've never been in that situation. And there's, there's, that's incredible and amazing. But the flip side to that, that I think is never talked about, but equally as difficult and in, and in certain elements more difficult. Cause like part of me wants to be like, of course you had nowhere to go. You were at the bottom. Like what else were you going to do? Of Like that's not that big of a choice. Cause if it didn't work, you were out of rent and like, you didn't have rent money. You didn't have two months of rent. So spending this one doesn't matter. Like, but again, I don't want to take anything away from that. Like mine has been constantly looking for sacrificing the thing that's good and comfortable now for the possibility of what could be better. And that's, that is to me, one of the things that probably holds back more entrepreneurs than burning the boats and saying, I got nothing to lose anyway. Yeah. Right? It's how do you get to where you can let go of what's good. And in my case, like I was the, like the top dog had the most influence in, in the organization that I was part of. I had a comfortable half a million dollar a year gig going that I didn't have to do much, but just show up. Yeah. And leaving that, that letting go of the comfort for that, what I knew was going to be painful was, was the thing that held me back. But simultaneously, I knew I had in me what is now blossomed in the cash flow tactics, that I was in a box and prevented 
from expanding on. And that's what ultimately pushed me out when I got called in and said, Hey, I've been told you're doing this, this, and this, is that true? I'm like, yeah, well, that's not what we do here. I was like, uh, I actually, it is what I've always done and I'm going to continue to do. And they said, no, this is the box you get to play in. And then that's when it was like, done. zero to one, I'm out, I'm yeah. done. I'm figuring out how to get out of here. And we, and, and, and we built that. So it was, it was more the, the constraints. And again, the entrepreneur idea of being put in a box, it was constraints being put on there. It didn't matter how good it was. It, I had to be who I am and be able to further develop what now is this message of cashless tactics. And it was the best, worst thing that ever happened because we had to burn a lot of relationships in the process. I wish I could go back and do it with the knowledge I have now because maybe we could have saved some of those, but relationships were burned, bridges were burned. It, it was difficult to, to undo that. Um, but it's all been for, for what we have now. Yeah. yeah, which is amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. One of the other, uh, yeah. Chris, about uh, some, some tactical, which is, which is, I know everyone's like, oh, I want to hear some tactics, but, uh, but I do want to, I just want to address something that kind of, you know, one, one of the things that Chris and I look for in, in, uh, in coaches and mentors like yourself is, is the ones that have kids. <laughs> like, this is such a, it's, you know, and I, I, I kid a little bit, but it's serious. It's such a big part of like following someone because, before kids, Brad, we, you know, you have an amazing amount of time, but you convince yourself that you're so crazy busy. And then you have your first kid and you're like, holy shit, I had all this time and now I don't have any time. <laughs> and then you have your second kid. You're like, whoa, I had so much time with one. And now I don't have any time. Um, you have your sixth kid coming on the way, right? Number six. Six on its way, yep. Which is like, which is phenomenal in itself and, uh, and you're just you're 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 rocking out such a, a beautiful business that's helping crazy helping people and extremely successful. Like, and on top of that, we're crazy enough to homeschool all of these kids. So I love it. Uh, I love it. Anyway, I love it. Um, uh, balance. That's my question. Like, what? Like, where's the balance with it? How do you find like family balance? Like, uh, how uh, is it? Is it being structured with your calendar? Is it? Uh, is it? You know where? How do you find a balance of like building a business and doing something like following your dream at the same time, having kids and a wife you need to support? I mean, this is what, you know, a lot of, a lot of striving entrepreneurs run back to uh, the, the false sense of security with a nine to five because of this. Like, no, I have, I have kids and a wife I got to support. I'm going to just stick with this because, um, because that's, it's, it's, it's safe. sure it's safe. Yeah. That oh, man. Cool. Such a good question. Can I draw? I want to draw this out. Yes, please. Um, so this is my superpower is making things simple enough through diagrams. Um, but the, the way we look at it, so this is a principle we actually teach on a regular basis as well, is this balance you talk about. We look at it that there's four areas of life that we're all seeking balance, right? Physical, spiritual, emotional, physical, spiritual, emotional. What's the one I'm missing? Mental mental, right? So we want to develop in all of these ways, right? And anytime we're in constraint in one of these, the what's going through our mind is I had enough time or I'm unhappy for some reason because we're constrained in growth in one of these four areas, right? Now, yeah. to answer your question of, of balance, I want to ask you guys a question first and everybody listening. If I could write a check with as many zeros as you need on it to be free forever, which one of these four boxes would you give me in exchange? I think they're all more valuable than that check. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I would because it would diminish my quality of life. Yeah. I'm gonna call BS. <laughs> Do you know why? Because this is what's this is the reality. Like I don't remember who said it, but somebody said, um, show me your calendar and your bank account and I'll tell you where your priorities are. Mm right? Yes. How many of us are like, think about yourself when you graduated from high school versus right now, your physical condition, are you in as good a shape as you were when you were senior high school? A lot of people would say no. No. Right. Or think about the qual, like how much learning have you done since you graduated from college? Yeah. From right. a mental standpoint, how much you have invested there? Right. A lot of people are, are sacrificing that. And what's the excuse that they use to say, I'm not able to do that. Well, they're too busy working. Mm -hmm. So most people's life, they, they think that money 
is going to get them what they want. And as they pursue money, what they find is this box here expands and pushes out one or more or all of those areas. Mm. That'd be pretty accurate to represent. So like the harder we push for success to get things financially, to have our time back, it actually squishes out and we don't have any time for the things that matter. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, here's the answer in balance is what we teach and what we strive and what I strive to do. And I'll tell you how I do this in a second, which is why I need to do this. We take the box of money and it becomes the foundation that we build expansion in these four areas. And if you're listening, you can't see this, but if you're watching it, it'll make sense. Money is not what we want. We want these four areas, but, um, but it requires money to be able to do those things. Okay, we have to have money, we have to control it, we have to understand it has to support us. So as it comes down, and now we flip the script, and instead of working for money, money works for us, and we're empowered in that conversation and using that as a tool to get our outcomes, something opens up that's been hidden behind it. Mm -hmm. And it's this box of purpose. Mm -hmm. And as we pursue purpose, it, it does not crowd out the other areas, but it expands the entire box. Mm -hmm. And so for me, wrapping up purpose into what I do at Cashflow Tactics, it drives me and allows me time. While yes, it's incredibly difficult and demanding to grow a business, it gives me more capacity because I'm driven through purpose to be able to give myself permission to expand in all four of these areas. Mm, that's huge. If you are listening to this on the uh, podcast, it may be like, we've never actually asked you to do this, but you should go over to YouTube to the Axo Concepts and check out the diagram because the visual is literally worth a thousand words. It's not about that. It's part. That's and huge. So, go, ahead, go ahead. And so the way that the, what I do, like the mechanism that I put in place for this is I run my life in 90 day targets. And every 90 days, I set reset or update or set new targets, but I set them in five areas, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and professional around like what my targets are. And those are always attached to earnings because that's the, you know, profit is a tool of validation inside of the business world. Right. So I, I have to, because for me, my business, because it's purposeful, it can be so time consuming that I forget about the things that really matter to me when I'm in the moment. Right. Yeah. But I have these targets that allow me ex so I can measure my progress in all four of these areas of my life every 90 days. Mm -hmm. And that keeps me grounded and keeps me focused and keeps me balanced. Um, Cause everything has a time and a season and some are more like some are a bigger focus. I have bigger objectives and some of them are just, I don't want to lose ground in these areas. And my targets are just, you know, mentally right now, I don't have a lot of time to reinvest because I'm so challenged in another area, but I'm just not going to lose ground and I'm going to do X, Y, Z, right? And then there's some times where we're going to make big pushes. Like we did a, you know, physically we did a, um, a Navy SEAL challenge a while back. I mean, that was like a big one that we were pushing and forced us to grow when other ones just sort of treaded water. But it's, it's a conscious effort toward progress in all four of them. And this is why I love being an entrepreneur is I don't have to have the boundaries of nine to five. Mm -hmm. I get to pursue these, like I have 24 hours to pursue these and I don't have to fit it from five in the morning to nine in the morning or, you know, 5 p.m. to like, those are the constraints that have held me back in the past, but now it's just life. And if you, if you, like, if you see my life and see me on Facebook or see me on Instagram or see me and my business partners, like there isn't a blend. Like I just went out, like my, it was my birthday yesterday we just went out and had a little birthday cake thing and it was 11 in the morning and we did that. And then I came back to my office and then we're going to go on. Like I got my kids scheduled for a walk when we're done with this and we're going to go. So it's it, but then tonight I'll, I'm going to be on editing copy for my copywriters for the, you know, the next ad set we're going to run next week. So it just is life and it's just full. Yeah, totally. But what's so valuable about what you're depicting and what you're saying is that when you have the target, it's, it's not that you're going to necessarily hit them all the time but you know where, if you're off, where you're off and why. And then we, we read a book, um, I believe it was, uh, Ascent, it was actually from, uh, you know, from, from the mastermind. From, from the mastermind. It was, uh, Someone really smart has a mastermind where they read really cool books. <laughs> really great books that change lives. I can't remember, we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll send you the link later. Uh, but, <laughs> but it was, it talked about not balancing, but counterbalancing. 
And like, you're going to, you're going to go off in certain directions, but if you don't know where you're going, you don't know if you're off or not. And knowing where you're going, having those 90 day targets and having a vision of where you want to go in all these areas of your life is what allows you to self correct and get back on course. And regularly going back to see where you are in, in relationship to all those, all those targets, whether you hit them or not, you're, you're regularly going back and saying, okay, where did I, how did I come up? Did I come up short on this one? Did I, did I push past it? So it, it, it keeps it top and, of And long. everyone, like, especially, I mean, we've just been talking about this employee versus entrepreneur mentality. What happens in school if you don't hit the target? You get punished. And it goes on your permanent record. You got a C <laughs> in that. And it's forever more you got a bad grade. Yeah. And so a lot of times we're programmed to set goals with that same mentality. We're afraid to set goals because we might not hit them. And if we set it and didn't hit them, now I got to see on my report card. Mm. Get rid of that. Like what you guys said, it doesn't matter whether you hit or not. It matters that you set it. And then when you don't, it's just matters of failures is we just learn. But if we don't set the target, I can't measure my gap. And then I can't say what needs to fill that gap to get any better. But like one of the first times we really got serious, me and my business partners, like Ryan and Jimmy, we do this all together. And we got really serious about it. I went quarter after quarter after quarter, like miserably missing targets. But then it was like, oh, okay, that's exposing the core of what's really been holding me back that I never would have seen. And it's also not this, this is the other problem about employees is like financial success is this someday 40 years from now when all the stars have aligned, I've done all the things right. And then like I arrive at this, this date of retirement that everything works out. It's like a lot of us set our goals that way too, where it's like, I don't need to worry about that I'm off a little bit right here because we're in this for the long run and I set these unrealistic, unachievable, undefinable goals either. That's why we like 90 days is it gives us enough time to work on it, but it's short enough to adjust and learn. So Yeah, that's awesome. Let's jump into that for a second. So you said financial freedom. Uh, what does financial freedom mean to you? So if you think that was good, you got to listen out for the next episode because this is part two of this interview. And Chris, what are they in store for? So in the next part, in part two of the interview, what we're going to be talking about is the definition of financial freedom, what that really means and how to attain it. We're going to talk about how to completely change the rules of the financial game. And we're going to pose and answer this question. If I could write you a check a check for $10 million or really an unlimited amount of zeros and put it into your retirement account, would your reality change tomorrow? Ooh, it's a good one, right? Yeah, the so answer to that is going to be in part two of this episode. So definitely check out for the episode for next week. Yes. Thanks so much for listening to Yoga Entrepreneur Secrets. Do you have a question that you'd like us to answer raw and uncut on the podcast? If you want your questions answered, all you need to do is head over to Apple Podcasts and do three simple things. One, rate and review telling us what you think of the podcast. Two, in that review, ask anything you want related to yoga. And three, if you want a shout out, leave your Instagram handle or name. And that's it. Then listen in to hear your question answered live, raw, and uncut. Join us next time on Yoga Entrepreneur Secrets Podcast. Thanks.